making friends as an adult is very hard. It's very hard. Being a bit more present, putting the phone down a little bit more. It makes interactions transactions. Social media also adds to that isolation because, oh, well, I saw your story yesterday. Yeah, I know. I know you're good. Yeah. No one asked us how things were going because they thought they knew how it was going based on a photo we had posted four months ago. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Tangents with Tyler and Todd. How are you doing today, Todd? (sighs) Even though I know the answer. (laughs) I was doing good today, but then it became a night. Yeah. Basically, we've been without internet. I know this all sounds like like such a Trivial. millennial problem, oh, yeah. but we've been without internet for six days and it was supposed to be three days and a new modem was supposed to come to us. And on day two, I was like, you know what? Something doesn't seem right. So I called and the order had been canceled. So they're like, we're going to send anyone out. Basically, we're on our third attempt at getting a new replacement modem. And a, I don't know when they're gonna get it here we've spent probably <laughs> like 10 hours on the phone this week and i know I, the i know the 1-800 number by heart now yeah i want to be clear this is obviously way better than a few weeks ago when we didn't have water and oh yeah <laughs> i think <laughs> i think the thing is we were able to troubleshoot that you know like the rubber boots went on we w- we went out in the lake or you went out in the lake i should say that was within our control. It's just really annoying to, we live further outside the city, so we don't have a good cell phone connection either. Oh, it's awful. Like, that's the thing. In order to make phone calls, we're not we need connected wi- right now. We need Wi Fi for Wi Fi Assist yeah. to make the phone calls. What drives me crazy, though, is just like, the one I spoke to last night just confirmed. I was like, man, just tell me it's supposed to come today. Tell me it's coming. And he's like, I can't confirm it, but I promise you, if not, we'll send a technician the next day. And he lied to me. And that's what hurts. Yeah. I just, I fell for the lie. The thing is, you consistently believe these companies. If I'm on the phone with the bank, if it's a phone company, it doesn't matter who it is. They lie. They are just trying to get you off the phone so they can answer the next phone. I take it personal, though, when they lie. Like, yeah, well. I thought we built something. You asked me how my day was going. I gave you all my personal information to confirm who I am, and I thought we had something. You, th- <laughs> you <laughs> thought you we- had a connection? I thought I found my number two. You're my number one. I thought I had number two. Yeah. Especially, like, I, I mean, if you're listening to this in the U.S. or U.K., Australia, <laughs> wherever, I'm sure that phone companies are probably the same. But in Canada, I just need to give a particular shout out to Bell. (laughs) They, if you're a Canadian, you know, although you know what? It's funny. In Canada, because we have like a monopoly or an oligopoly, we're not, this is not going to be an economic lesson. Well, no, basically Canada has this thing in place called the CRTC, which like regulates all communication things. But also part of that is in order to be a phone company in Canada, you have to be like a Canadian company, which limits us because nowadays who has the money to invest in starting a phone company? Basically like we're, we're cut off from the competitive rest of the world. A hundred percent. So like how it works is government regulated industry. So like the airline, for example, the airline industry, we have Air Canada, WestJet, Porter, I love Porter. <laughs> Por- Porter rallying hard from They're in number prop three. Planes. You know what? On okay. a stormy day, you know that that Porter flight at 658 is coming in. Those props are churning those snowflakes out of their way, whereas a jet's like, ooh, I'm too cold. I can't <laughs> land. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> anyway, point being is those the government in Canada for some reason made the decision like we can't have American Airlines we can't have United we can't have any of those things same with phone companies we don't have AT&T we don't have Verizon we don't have any of that we thought we were on to something because so when we were on the road trip as soon as we crossed into Washington State from BC oh we yes I ditched remember our Canadian sim cards mm-hmm. and went to Walmart and got American sim cards and we thought it was a scam. We, Wait till you guys hear this. We thought it was amazing. We're like, oh my God, this is the best. So we're like, 
these are our new numbers. We're just going to be those cool <laughs> kids in Canada with American numbers. Well, as soon as we Yeah, crossed- I grew up in Washington <laughs> State. So what? Yeah, you're going to want to have to use a different area code. <laughs> Sorry, you can't call me. It's international <laughs> calling. Um, but as soon as we crossed back into New Brunswick, literally, we took... Um, I forget the border crossing we took. It was a really small one. Like, it was a small town and there was a little river. St. Stephen? St. Stephen, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. As soon as we crossed pull, in... P- everyone pull up Google Maps, guys, <laughs> like, t- to get the full picture that Todd's made. It was just like... Well, I remember it was on the American side. We had yeah. to go through a small town. And then we were like, is this right? Because we were towing the trailer with us. And then you just cross this little tiny bridge. And the border agency was so sweet. And... It was just a really positive experience. Anyway, as soon as we crossed into Canada, both of our phones, dead to the world. Yeah. Nothing we could do. Like, we if we stopped to get gas, we could quickly connect to their hotspot. But they said, like, you're going deeper and deeper into Canada. This, this, you're not roaming. Like, they... They were on to us. They were on to us. They said, you're going further, boys, and you're making good speed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, I really, this is a, we're, I, I want to cheers us. Oh, I hit the mic. Sorry, okay. everyone. We are off to the races. We are off to the races. <laughs> you know what? This isn't like wine or vodka or anything. We're having a tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wine tea. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a mulled wine tea. No. Um, but we really are. Home all- brew. We, we brewed our own tea. <laughs> <laughs> a little kombucha. Sorry, continue, love. I keep interrupting. I'm just being a fuddy-duddy. Yeah, you're being a fuddy-duddy tonight. But I just, I really think it needs to be made crystal clear that (laughs) we believe very strongly that if there was more than like three companies in an industry that is worth billions of dollars, maybe you could get some service. Maybe you could have internet or get a flight that's reasonable. Can we Maybe talk Maybe I wouldn't can we be lied to by the 1-800 number. I do quickly want to just touch on this on the flights on the airline industry. What it gets you is Todd's brother for example lives in Ontario. We're going to be visiting them in a week and we're really really looking forward to it. However, going from where we live in Nova Scotia to Ontario, which is the equivalent of flying from like Maine to Chicago, our flight. Don't ask me. I like. I don't know geography. Yeah. Well. Okay. Well, luckily, luckily, one of us is here. I thought Argentina was a state until Tyler corrected me at like twenty years old. I just. He's just along for the ride, you guys. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you actually are really smart, just in like different w- ways. Different ways. You. You would thrive like you're gonna survive in the boardroom and like in the smart world but when the zombie apocalypse oh, yeah. happens you're the first one dead D- gone gone like they said i'm gonna eat that brain because it's nice and juicy <laughs> <laughs> so anyway get this flights to go from the equivalent of maine to chicago how much i'll let you mull it over for two seconds spoiler alert twelve hundred dollars per person okay so this is what drove me that's outrageous think about this one okay pull up the google maps here we go so tyler is from labrador but his parents moved to newfoundland so when i was flying from halifax to goose bay labrador it was almost thirteen hundred dollars it was sixteen hundred i I remember it quite clearly. I am not good with numbers (laughs) this is why my credit card often doesn't get paid do you know what's funny when uh, Todd's dad said this recently. <laughs> Timmy, if you're listening to this, <laughs> whenever Todd is telling a story and it's like financial numbers, to- Todd's dad always looks at me because Todd, <laughs> his numbers are always on like the cheaper side. Like he's always very generous with it. For you to visit me on our first Christmas 15 years ago was $1,600 for you to fly direct from Halifax to Goose Bay. Wild. Okay, so my numbers might be slightly off. I also just don't care. That's what I have you for. There are certain things that we each do for each other, and yours is making sure I don't go bankrupt. 
Yeah, well, we <laughs> we we each bring something to the table. But where Todd was going with that is there was a scam where you could book a flight to it's called Gander, Newfoundland, and on the milk run to get to Gander, you go to Goose Bay on the way. But so because- you would leave one sec. So you would leave. So. Now, we're now gonna the go Google Maps just, is still open. We're going to remind you. We left Halifax and went to Goose Bay for $1,600. But if we wanted to go from Halifax to Goose Bay with final destination being Gander... It was 800 But, like, then they started in um, this penalty that if you got off the flight in Goose Bay and didn't get back on the flight to go to Gander, they would charge you something like double the ticket price to make sure that you got on that flight. Because people were like, well, like... I'm just not going to take the connection. I'm going to save the money and just stay in Goose Bay. That was happening all across Canada. That's just like our personal experience with it. Yeah. And the point being is... What is the point? How do we get onto flights? uh, Our week. No internet. Bell Alliant. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) We're becoming a Rogers household. (laughs) East Link. East Link. We're, we're, We're switching somewhere, but... Yeah, I don't know. It, this is a big, big tangent, but I just, I, I, it drives me crazy when consumers don't have choice. Law These blahs. billion dollar <gasps> law blahs. We is- got to talk about this. Okay, so we. It's love- a grocery. So it is a grocery store that is in Canada. It's, it's the largest grocer in Canada. Yeah, there's only three main grocers in Canada. Yet again, three seems to be a nice number. It is like our Walmart. Or our Piggly Wiggly, if you're in Texas. <laughs> like Safeway. Or like Heb. Wherever, whatever American state you happen to be coming from. Because like a grocery store chain within just one state is equivalent to one across all of Canada. True, Keep in mind, yeah. like, the we're population only, of California so is the same as the population of all of Canada. And we have the second largest landmass in the country. So it's, it, or world. in the world. Like it's a weird place. Anyway, Loblaws. Got rid of the 50% off sticker. That is what Tyler and I thrive on. Basically, when salad bags are within X amount of days of going bad, they slap a 50% off sticker on it. And you get, usually there's two bags that are going bad around the same time. So you but buy one and you get the second one it's free. Not, this is the crazy thing. It's not going bad. It's if you buy it on a Tuesday if you wake up Thursday morning and you think you're going to have that salad for lunch, it's not going to happen. But guess what? If you're having that salad for dinner tonight, it is going to be the best salad of your life. If you have it for lunch the next day, it's going to be amazing. That is why we buy it because it's we're saving half the amount. But, but also, the, let me finish. Okay. The reality is... I like it when you take control. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is your nan was here for tea earlier today. That was her topic when we were sitting at the table. That's hot on her mind because the people that are going to be the most affected by this, it is incredibly annoying for us. It pisses me off that Galen Weston is worth multi-billions of dollars, the guy that owns that company. And not for nothing, he didn't even start it. His grandfather did. Yeah. So my point being is... He is doing that, making that decision. And who is it affecting? It's affecting your grandmother in a way that is very different than the way that it's affecting us. We like it because we're being frugal. She is doing it from necessity. Because she's a pensioner. Like a lot of people that are on fixed incomes. I'm so... The point of this whole conversation, which is not what this podcast episode is about. We're Sobeys family now. That's the other grocery here. So cheers to another billion dollar Canadian household. Like, the thing is, these companies, these billionaires, they do not care about us. They don't care about your grandmother. They don't care about any of the seniors out there that are struggling. But they're best friends with all of our politicians. Yeah. Anyway, big business and us. Not friends. (laughs) What are we at? 14 minutes in. But, yeah. But you know what? Uh, We needed to get... I'm telling you. We needed to get this. It's just been so much. But that's what's annoying is... The consolidation of the economy is really frustrating as a consumer because where do I turn? Yeah. In Canada, there's three, back to phones, there's three major phone carriers. But then people are like, oh, well, you can turn to Win Mobile or Freedom Mobile or all these different things. 
Those are just subsidiaries of the three big companies. They're just the knockoff brand that they're charged, still ripping you off. And like, well, they were independent, but then they got they, bought. They got bought by them because they said, Mm-mm. "But don't worry, Canada has the Competition Bureau, which makes sure that all business transactions re- don't result in an unfair market for consumers." And they're doing a really good job, and should all probably get a huge bonus. They deserve it. Like honestly, they've been working so hard, so hard. <laughs> Well, Tyler, now that that's off our chest and we've discussed how my day was. <laughs> I just, I to put a bow on all of this, I do want to say the reason I think that it is so frustrating and annoying is, is the fact that it is not within our control where other problems that go wrong. Like if we, if we lost power right now, you and I, we have skills, we would get things going, we would figure it out. Same with the water, the septic, everything. All of it. But the reality is in in 2024, you got to get connected. Like you really can't do anything. Yeah. The the little lights that you installed, I Alexa, am... she doesn't want nothing to do with us nothing. now. And it's so... No internet? I never know how to dress when going outside because I can't ask what the temperature is. Don't know. I don't know. And I'm going into it blind. And how many times this week have I gone for our walk in ankle socks One and the little many. tiny crack in my between my sweatpants and my ankle socks has frozen my ankle on the walk <laughs> and it has been really hard and I just think in 2024 I should have the internet to ask Alexa what the weather is so that I don't have to freeze my ankles off <laughs> vote Todd for president <laughs> I'm not even American but I'm running <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I just feel like when you're dealing with all these companies and things that are, they just, the common sense and the basic customer service is all gone. It makes me want to curl up into a ball and just hide from the world, which I know isn't like the normal response at all. But I feel like that kind of, I don't know, it's, it's just a coping thing, but kind of segues into our what we wanted to talk about today, and that's friendships. The complete opposite of curling <laughs> into a ball and hiding from the world. But for, I don't think for everyone it is because there, I mean, there's a, definitely a sliding scale on, you know, introverts, extroverts. We tend to curl in a ball. Like, we're, I wouldn't say that you and I are the most. Which is kind of weird considering what we do for a living. Like, it's very weird. I, yeah, I was going to say that. I think a lot of people would be shocked to know that you and I are both very introverted. And making friends or even maintaining a friendship takes a lot of work from you and I. It's not something that comes natural. You know how there's some people that are just so outgoing and they have so many different friend groups and so many different friends and they can always call on someone to keep them going. That's not I you. Get, and you know what though? I gotta be honest. I don't buy it. Oh, I totally do. I, I don't. I do because so when I... All that hoopla? No, but when I'm in the mood to be friends or for instance, we have a bunch of people coming over to play Ramoli, which is like... <laughs> we have... <laughs> yeah, okay, hold on. We have 25 mm. people coming here the day after tomorrow, and we're like, we are not hermits. I want to make that very clear. We're pretty close. We're hermit esque, <laughs> we're hermit adjacent, but <laughs> we live next door. <laughs> the thing is, I don't like investing my time with people that it's not. If, if during the time that we're together, if I'm like, oh, I wish I was home right now, I need to be home right now. I don't like that. I hate being out in public and being like, I just want to be home. You you don't like small chat. Well, that's oh, also yeah, that's part of the nightmare. reason why we cut each other's hair. So we still cut each other's hair, even though the pandemic is over. We go down in the basement. We cut it so that the mess isn't up here. But it's because... Neither of us enjoy the small chat of sitting down and literally being trapped by someone with scissors and an electronic razor. 
and having to talk about the weather and what we have going on this week. That is a nightmare to me. Like, I don't think you would enjoy if we went. Well, I don't. Yeah. I don't enjoy it at all. I don't enjoy anything about it. It's So I find, I get what you're saying about the small chat, but that's different than when you're inviting people over. Like I find... Here's the thing. Here is my (laughs) very honest truth. And I'm sure some people are going to be like, you're going to judge me. But I I just don't want to spend my time with people that I don't like. And if I don't know that I like you before hanging out with you, then it's difficult for me to want to put myself out there and invest time with you. But how would you know you don't like them if you haven't hung out with them? So when we go in like a, a social setting, so like when we have people over in a few days, 25 people is a lot of people. I know that of that group of people, there's going to be someone that I'm going to get along with great. It's going to be fun. I'm going to have a great time. What I'm saying is maintaining relationships with like 15 different people. Like there are fully people out there that they have a breakfast friend and they have a lunch friend and then they go to coffee with so-and-so and and they go to the movies. You have like all of these different relationships. And I think that that's amazing if you like that. But I am not that guy. I will never be that guy. I've never been that guy. No. And you aren't either. And media, like movies and TV shows and stuff make it seem that how we are is completely weird and abnormal. But I actually think it's way more normal than not. I love being social with people. I love having a big dinner party and like chatting with people. But I'm not here to like t- spend two hours the next day texting you. And like I don't have a lot of like close, close friends. I have a lot of acquaintances. Yeah. So just to be clear, in case anyone that comes to Ramoli and this is now Aaron is like, wow, did he hate that I was there? You're not saying like what Tyler is saying is people that we bring into our personal space and invite into our home. That's different than going to a friend's like for you to go to a friend's say housewarming, where there's going to be that friend's 20 different friend groups showing up there, that takes a lot for you. And it would be hard for you to go to that type of situation. But no, that no, actually, we, that's not but what I'm no, saying. Just a, a couple nights ago, we went to have, um, we went to Chris and Jenna's and had like games night yeah. for Lindsay's birthday. You loved that. Like it was you, so much fun. Yeah. A bunch of people that I didn't know. I had a great time. What was, I'm saying is if I had a great time with those people, That was great. The night was the night, but I'm not going to the farmer's market with you tomorrow. Don't, don't call me and ask me to go to dinner in two days from now. (laughs) Like I, I'm being serious. I know that this, uh, people are going to have opinions about this, but like, I like hanging out in like social situations and like doing all of that. But the investment of like this connection and like close friends and family. I, I don't invest myself into people lightly. Yeah. That's, I totally think you're bang on with that one. Like you have a guard up. I've said this before, you have a guard up and it takes a lot to kind of like get past that and into your inner circle. But once you're in there, like (laughs) I'm, you're good. But you know what? And even in random social situations, like, like it, I, it, I enjoy it, but I just, it's the, it's the extra layer. It's the, it's the background of it all. I'm like that too. So yeah. I'm not quite as, um, I see, I see antisocial, small social battery, however you want to describe it. I'm not quite that. I'm very much the same as you in regards to friendship. So I have also a very, very small group of people that I would open up to in my life. I'm not the type that has the breakfast friend, the coffee friend, the dinner friend, the going to theater friend. That's never going to be me. But I find I do get a sense of recharge in large group settings Mm -hmm. because it's a chance to like one-on-one communicate with people and kind of, you know, check in, hear stories just get that like endorphin rest 
endorphin rush, but I'm not doing that every weekend. That's like once a quarter. And <laughs> I'm best. like, and I'm good with that. Um, Lately, it's been way more though. But I feel as though it took a long time for me to accept that that's the person that I naturally am because of what you said earlier. <laughs> Sorry. If, if you're, you're watching. Yeah. If you're watching the YouTube version of this, Charlie is on the couch tonight instead of Eddie, and he's so asleep that he's now doing his twitching. It's just, it melts our heart every time. It's funny. So normally Eddie is up on the bed, but he's in our bed right now asleep. And Charlie's just here pretending he's running. (laughs) Hey, buddy. But what I was saying is I find... Kind of like what you said earlier about how Hollywood and TV shows, there's these massive friend groups. You're always doing yeah. something. It was this pressure. And I felt like it wasn't until I'm now 33. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that I felt confident being alone. And I feel like all through my 20s, sure, we were we were making sacrifices to put our business first, put our relationship first, all that. But there was still this part of me that was like, I should be, I should be building like the mimosas for brunch friend. Like, you know, that, that guilt. Sunday fun day. Like let's go girls. You know, it is cool though. When you, that the confidence that builds when you get older, that's probably the thing that I enjoy the most. I mean, I don't enjoy feeling older. By the way, I'm going to say the confidence thing and then we'll come back. Um, I just, this is kind of a tangent, but I totally get what you mean. When is the last time I put jeans on to go outside of the house? Like, I was always the type that would have jeans or khakis or something to go to the grocery store, go to the hardware store. Sweatpants. Stained sweatpants is my staple now. And I love it because... who cares? I'm only out for a hot second and then I'm coming home. I'm not going to spend time changing. I will say... um, (laughs) <laughs> uh, so I, this is a bit of a tangent but I do our errands for the both of us like I'm the one that goes to Costco like if we need something because it's like probably like 45 minutes for us to drive in and Todd just he, you don't like shopping it's not something that you enjoy so I, I do like the staples yeah I find it unpredictable so um I don't like if I get somewhere and something that I wanted or needed isn't there. That's just, probably the ADHD it's too. It's the ADHD. Yeah. It's like the, I, I don't get an endorphin rush from it. It's. <laughs> hate it. I hate it. How many times <laughs> have you and I have gone through, never if it's groceries with oh cold product in it, but there are numerous times where if we're at Home Depot and I, for I'm just using them as an example, but I get to the cash and there's a line. And I'm like, I can't. And I walk away from the cart and you're there to like take over. But I go to the car. There has been times where we're in Costco. There's like not a full cart, but like 50% we'll say. Todd is like, I'm done. The line is to the produce. I'd rather buy my toilet paper at a gas station and pay more than wait in this line. See. Can't do it. So he doesn't go anymore. (laughs) But. My point being, tangent, is when I run errands into the city, I do put on jeans. I put on a nice boot. I put on like a nice jacket. You always look so cute when you When I go to the city, do you find? Yeah. That also, I'm like, he's either like trying to do that to make himself like, you know, more energized to get it done or he's having an affair. Come on. (laughs) You, <laughs> I guessed when you've had the best, you never want to test the rest. <laughs> no, but I think that's okay. Like acknowledging that you have a smaller social battery, I think it's also more normal. Yeah, I don't think that people have that many friends. I and I don't trust if they do. I I'm actually really curious about this. Like, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you could. Kind of like, let us know. How are you, how do you feel about that? Because what do you think? I don't know. I think it's a mixed bag, but I, I I feel like there's more people that are in your situation, yours and I situation, than not. That like you feel the pressure to have more friends, but you're actually naturally more introverted. Maybe it's also because we're coupled. That mm. like you are my best friend. So if I'm out with the girls 
Divorce. But where's Tyler? Do you know what I mean? Like you, you and I are a friend group. So then how do our friend groups interact with that? But then that's also unhealthy that, you know, like it's a really weird thing because then there's people that say you shouldn't only want to be with your spouse or your partner. You should have friend groups outside. But I feel like it's so nuanced. Everyone is so unique and everyone needs a different amount of social interaction and a different type of social interaction to feel fulfilled. Yeah, you're right about that. Like different groups and different people give you something different they contribute something different remember when we lived out west and you were like i want to try and meet people and make more friends and you did that hard that was really really hard like we lived in a place that like you grew up here you knew you had so many people that you knew and then you went to university here and then that's how we met. We bought our first house here. I cried. We timed it weirdly, but we're just like, we like analytics. So when we left here to move out West, we drove because, so, so Tyler was being moved with his bank, but we didn't want to fly because Charlie was only one at the time. And we've never flown our dogs and I don't ever want to put them on a plane. It just, it makes me nervous putting them on a plane. So we drove. And what was it? Every 30 to 35 minutes, I would just break out in a full sob, like ugly cry because it was so hard leaving. And we made the decision preemptively knowing that that was probably going to happen for you to drive, which is weird because if you've watched any of our vlogs or been paying attention through anything we've posted, Tyler is always in the passenger seat but you drove for the first two days it was hard yeah well like you when you have this whole like bedrock of relationships all different types of relationships the relationships with your nan your mom your other grandmother like all of those things and you're being like pulled away from that not to mention your friendships of course that's going to be a hard thing it was hard for me having spent like the four years that we were together before we moved to rip apart for that from that I can't even imagine what that would have been like for you and then on top of all of that all of our friendships and then all all of a sudden like five days later we show up and we're in this town that we've never been to before we don't know anyone how do you create friendships with people in a new city that you've never been to before. You're not in university anymore or college. So there's no structure. You're not in high school. You're not on a sports team. There's no like forced friendship. You go to work. But see, that's where... That changed it, for us. There are... And I think it like that still has a lasting effect on us because basically we finished university, got married, and moved across country to be by our, and were by ourselves. And to, be, yeah. to be by ourselves, but like <laughs> it wasn't to be by it ourselves. wasn't to be by ourselves. Tyler got transferred, and we ended up there, and we were by ourselves. I needed but him alone. It was no. I think that that's why we became so comfortable in either being by ourselves, yeah. or with each other. Totally. So I worked as um, basically I worked in pools, and at that time I oversaw swimming lessons. So my schedule was more evenings and weekends. I had to be there when the swimming lessons were happening. So I would work a Tuesday from like lunchtime to eight through to Saturday. And you would work a Monday, like nine to five, Monday to Friday type job. 8.30 to five. Yeah, whatever it was. But bastards. our only day together was Sunday. Yeah. So... That was the day that you and I really hung out. And outside of that, the days that we like, I'd be off on Mondays, but you were working. So I had to get comfortable with hanging out by myself because I didn't know anyone there. I had to learn how to go and have coffee, you know, go sit at Starbucks by myself and just to get out of the house. And I think that's a really cool skill that I learned because I totally agree. But that was in our foundational years and something that is now like just very something comfortable. Same as movies, Um, like your Mm -hmm. space movies. I don't enjoy those. You would go watch those on Saturdays while I was working because you knew I didn't want to go. Can I go on a tangent? 
So Avengers Infinity War was coming out in theaters and I was like, I'm not, (laughs) there's not a reality that exists where I'm even inviting Todd. And there was not a reality that I was going even if I was invited. I went to a matinee and I, of course I had friends, but they were like normally like girls or like other gay people and like no one really wanted to go to an Avengers movie. And I went by myself and there's this weird like stigma or I don't know, like judgment and doing those things by yourself. I had the absolute best time. It was so nice. I didn't have to answer questions. Didn't have to explain characters. I don't mind doing that for you. I want to be clear because. Oh yeah. Cause so. He'll, Todd always does that. So I tend to fall asleep pretty quickly when we are like, let's go into bed. It's, Can we explain what that looks like? What? So when we when we go into bed, typically we'll have like a laptop because we don't have a TV in our room. Maybe we'll put one in. We haven't done our room yet. I don't know. Like, do you like our? Setup? Well, we had the TV at the dome where because uh, the dome had the pull out couch yeah. that we slept on every night, and we had the TV at the foot of the bed, but we didn't use it after like the novelty I don't of think having a TV. Snuggling. Yeah, like yeah. we put the laptop on one of our chests so that the other one has to snuggle in and it just kind of works. So like, one of one of Todd. I know, it goes on Tyler's on when Tyler, so I snuggle in. Can you can you explain to me or name a time in our relationship where a laptop has sat on your chest and I have snuggled in? There's been like a handful of times. Okay. Usually you've been dozing off and for some reason I'm still awake, but yeah. So (laughs) that's our setup. And it's because you got such a big chest. (laughs) It's just begging for me to snuggle into it. God. Anyway, um, how do we get on that? We were talking about your space movies and going oh, to the movie yeah. by yourself. So, oh, oh, no, no, no. So I, where, what I was going to say was, I don't want you to not ask questions if you're like, when you're snuggled in and you're right oh, here. Yeah. Like, and you have questions, ask them. Sometimes I know the answer, but, but I ask the question because it means a lot to you because you think that I care about the space movie. Yeah. And that means a lot to you. And I, I just like that. Little... Talks for 15 minutes on Gamora's backstory. But asleep... Like one minute in. (laughs) But yeah, don't always ask questions. But it was hard though. So that was something I find about friendships is I think moving out West was really transformative in my view of friendships because I felt that pressure of trying to like feel like you had to have a lot of friends and a big friend group. Moving out West, we moved, we had no friends the friends that we had back here, it became a lot of work on both sides to maintain that friendship. Plus, what, a three or four hour time difference? It naturally started to... Things changed. My life across the country was no longer relevant. When I'm talking about having to shovel 10 centimeters of snow that fell in October, and my friends here aren't... aren't Like, they're out mowing their lawn. Like, your realities are become very different very quickly. Yeah, you're so right. And then there was... The time difference was the biggest thing. That was the biggest thing. And three hours doesn't seem like a lot, but it is really a lot. Especially, like, you get off work, you come home, you make dinner. You're home by 7 by the time you uh, commute. You're home by 7. That's 10 o'clock back here. Yeah. Who are you calling at that hour? People are getting ready to go to work the next day and I'm just starting to unwind from mine. And I'm going to have to start to learn how to process that myself. And then when you're not working, you're tired or you're sad or you're lonely or you're just crying, being like, did we make the right decision? And I, you and I tried hard not to necessarily make work friends personal friends because what we found was we tried that at first we gave it a really good go we did we really tried but all too often you'd go for dinner or go see a movie or something and it would just revert to talking about work or gossiping about a person in the office or all these different things and it's like well i'm really not escaping this thing that i really don't enjoy 
And then you start to associate that person that you might have had a connection with, with like, it was a hard. I bet you, like, I bet you people find that actually really common. Like, if you hang out with people that you work with, inevitably, you're going to talk about work, which for a while, I think it's like you're you're tricking yourself in a way. I'm having I'm hanging out with people. I'm going for a glass of wine or whatever it is. You're being social. Yeah. But is that being social or is that just like an extension of your work? Yeah. It's not it doesn't feel you don't get a a, a release. You're not separating yourself. You're not finding that joy. Like I don't know. It Maybe. also it doesn't feel as authentic. It feels like out of necessity like we all we're all like we're all hating this like my last job that i was at no sorry not my last job the job before that the bank that i was at before the last bank the so last bank worked at two different banks yeah head it, on over to um <laughs> linkedin to see which <laughs> yeah i mean if you really want to creep you can find it but <laughs> it was it was really really bad to the point where the whole office at the end of the day would like we would all go to a bar and we would have like a glass of wine and just like debrief and say like everyone would be like how is management doing this like the vice presidents don't care the executives they don't all they want us to do is like sell more products and like it, it would get into this like space where well, it was they a literally negative spiral doubled, they doubled your targets and eliminated the entire 300 staff that was um like there to support the analysts that were there to support yeah. everyone in your office eliminated that doubled your targets and said, but who, but Good who, luck. but yes, but who cares? That's not relevant. Sorry. Like the point is, <laughs> is that that everyone wanted to complain about it. But if I had my time back, no, being the emotional maturity that I am now, I would have been like, I cannot change this. This is, multi-billion dollar company doesn't care about me they don't value me you really are a number i am a number and i'm a cog in their never-ending wheel and i can take my get my paycheck come home to you and build relationships lucky you lucky me a plus for me cheers to that (laughs) cheers to me coming home to you yeah cheers to both of us but the point being is like None of that really made anything better. And I wish that I didn't spend my time doing that. And I think in the corporate world, relationships and friendships often end up being that. It's not for everyone, but it does happen. But also, so on the flip of that, we tried the app um, Meetup, where you put in your hobbies, like what was of interest to you, and your phone would send you'd get a notification of a group is doing um frisbee i don't know tag football like i don't know what it would be but basically what Uh, acrylic painting in a loft on a for a wine night if you're into rugby there's a pickup (laughs) rugby match it was this thing that whatever you were into yoga we went to the yogas in the park Mm. like different things like that but even that I found hard. Do you know why? Why? Because I've thought about this a lot. People go there with groups of friends that they already know. They and- are not going there to want to chat with us. They're going with a group of people. Let's do yoga in the park. Yeah. And it's like six people going. Plus it's free. If Janice is like doing downward dog and like hey uh, you want to be friends with me and the group of six people <laughs> like they're like who's that weirdo yeah. hi we, janice hi, like yeah hey janice let's be friends but like that was always anytime we did those sort of like structured things people weren't there I, i'm sure people were there we just we need we needed to look harder for them well it, it's kind of like what I've come to realize is making friends as an adult is very hard. It's very hard. Especially if you're, um, I think if you, it would have been easier if we stayed here, we would have maintained the friends. We would have stayed in touch, 
things would have kept going. But unless like when, as an adult, when you move to a new city, it is very hard to make friends because the people that are from that city already have their friend group because that is their home. Yeah. And then if not, it's kind of viewed as transient. Well, you moved here. Are you going to be here forever? Turns how, out how we much weren't, my, but yeah. <laughs> they didn't need to know that at the time. But imagine though, had someone, I get why people are walled off because like, Imagine if someone had have invested their time in us. We have people that we became friends with. Like, of course we have friends. But our friends from back west, like, we don't talk to them a lot because... Their life... It's, again, the time zone. They're getting off work and we're going to bed. They're, like... Yeah. It's. I don't know. I, I really do think it's media that makes us all... Or, like social media maybe i don't know what it is but this can't be a unique to us experience like how do people do it all i also but i also blame social media for creating people being isolated so you and i are an extreme example posting podcast and youtube videos yeah but even just anyone posting a photo my personal facebook i have like a 100 and Like, it's just friends and family on there. Very small. And I post things. And even when we were out West, people thought that that one photo you post is the whole update. Yeah. They don't understand that that's just you showing a highlight or a low light or just a quick update. And, like, I I feel like that social media also adds to that isolation because... They're like, oh, well, I saw your story yesterday. Yeah, I know. I know you're good. Yeah. So then they don't ask you or they don't message you. And to be real, that's been taken even a step further in our life and like what we do for a living and how we share. Even though we're very vulnerable in these podcasts and same with our Sunday vlogs, this is still a fractional percent of our life of our personalities like there's so much more than we can fit in this like hour-long conversation of who we actually are but friends and family have a tendency to be like well we listened to your podcast we know what you did this week or we skimmed through it (laughs) yeah yeah probably but like that that It's a, it's a tricky... On the flip of that, though, what I actually find hard is coming back and trying to, like, reconnect. I find it hard because people think that they've seen everything. And then even though they haven't seen everything, it becomes a power dynamic in a, in a friendship or when you're trying to start one. I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but basically if you're trying to create a friendship and someone says, you know, as soon as someone... Obviously, everyone's going to Google. You meet someone, you're going to Google them. And I find it becomes a power imbalance because they think that... Oh, yeah. Because they've watched our videos, they know everything that's happened. But so they don't ask, how are you? Well, I saw your last video, so I know how you are. Or on the flip of that, without even like getting to update, they just brush over or update for you like they autofill a lot of information that would You're, be natural in a friendship so i'm gonna take this because i know what you're trying to say i'm butchering it <laughs> but well you're you're tiptoeing because you're worried about being too specific but it it's tricky because there are going to be people that are going to listen to this that are going to know that we're talking about them but this is our podcast and like i want to be honest But it happens pretty frequently where if we meet somebody that's like local or like in the community or whatever, and they present as though they don't know anything about us because we're not like, hi, we're Tyler and Todd. We have a podcast. We're YouTubers. Like we're just, it's, that's not how we are. We're just normal. And it happens quite often where we meet someone new and it's like a normal conversation as if you've never met before, but then they'll say something like they'll refer to Charlie as Charlie, 
even though we've never we've we've never said Charlie's name or they know about the land and that's a weird thing that I mean I'm not asking for sympathy that's not the reason we're talking about this but it is a weird imbalance that we never thought about before doing this for a living but i think that happens to everyone totally yeah as soon as you post something people i find what i'm trying to say is i think social media actually isolates because someone sees you post a photo of your dog and you at the beach they're not going to ask you how it was at the beach they saw the photo you're both smiling the dog's tongue is out Dog looks like it's smiling. We're happy. It takes away that opportunity for you to say, I was at the beach. Because they say, oh, yeah, I saw. How, yeah. Oh, yeah. What beach were you at? How was it? What was the weather like? Was it sunny? Were there many people there? You gathered all that information already from the background of the photo. So it takes away the natural conversation that comes from saying, I took my dog to the beach. And so I find just in general social media as it's become more prevalent in our lives it's rotten it's rotten and it's actually like made everyone so much less social because no one knows how to have a conversation anymore if i was to say oh my god you took the dog your dog to the beach how was it what was the weather like you'd be like whoa back the f- up bitch like what is going on here what's with the 21 questions are you the fbi like yeah. calm down do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I find very isolating. Ours is just an extreme example. Yeah. But I, I found that even beforehand. So when we lived out West and we'd fly back, no one asked us how things were going because they thought they knew how it was going based on a photo we had posted four months ago. But they didn't know. They didn't know that. Like, yeah, there's so much more. And I just, that's where I also feel it's hard to live up to that Hollywood expectation of so many friend groups because it's so weird. What is a friendship now? What is a friendship? You it, have it's definitely it's different than what it was a few years ago, but I think if this was a really this I wasn't expecting to have this conversation, <laughs> but truthfully, like if I can take anything away from this, it's just being a bit more present, putting the phone down a little bit more and having like real authentic conversations with people. And especially what you said about the social media side of things. Like I was just thinking about even my own relationships in my life. Like my sister, if she posts something, I don't, that doesn't mean that I know what that experience was like. I can still talk to her about that, but I don't. Yeah. Oh, I'm having an epiphany because like, I'm not good at that either. I like the photos and I move on. And then it's done. It's done. It's so transactional. It makes interactions transactions. Put it right here. (laughs) Right on a mug. Right on a mug. (laughs) All right. What do you think? Time for some tea? Time for some tea. Hey guys, I just need some advice and I want to know if you think if this is okay. I have been with this company for six years now and everyone says I'm so knowledgeable and I know a lot about the company, but I keep getting overlooked for supervisor. They keep saying, oh, it's your turn next, but it's been six years now. Do you think it's time to move on or stick it out until it's quote my turn? Move on because they already have, if they've passed you over... They've moved on. And I say this from personal experience because I am thinking of... Ta got got moved on a couple times. A couple of times. And I am thinking of one supervisor in particular. Her face is forever ingrained in, in my brain. But they will tell you all the things to make you go in for extra hours without claiming overtime or stay late or take on things that are technically their job, all with the hopes of being the next one for promotion. And I am telling you, they're just using you. Move on. I have a little bit of a controversial opinion that I want to share with the room. (laughs) So what's the pay raise on being a supervisor? Because I've been in a lot of situations where it's, an extra $1.50 an hour or two fifty an hour and you're the supervisor and all of a sudden you're scheduling the shifts and you're doing all of these different things 
for what a dollar fifty more an hour and, and mine I wasn't um this is what drove me crazy this is where I fell out of love with my job is I wasn't on call but I was expected to answer yeah and that, was that a, wasn't that, that wasn't that a was weekly a, that should have been illegal should have been illegal and it wasn't a week on week off my facility was closed one day of the year and that was Christmas and Christmas day I still went in to do all the water tests and do a site check on the facility because it needed to be done outside of that one day I wasn't on call but I was expected to answer but paid for 40 hours a week that drove me crazy that's where I fell out of love was like and then the one time you don't answer the phone where you've answered it all the other times for free the one time you don't answer it because you're trying to have a really nice trip with your husband to Banff and they throw the iron fist at you. And that's where I was like, wow. It's a really? very, it's very specific situation. But like, that's when I learned a payroll number really means you are nothing yeah. more than a payroll number. I do think that as you get older, you have situations in your career where you get humbled and you realize, oh, they really don't care about me. Mm -hmm. But you can take it two ways. You can say, okay, that's sad that I work for a company and no one really cares. I'm just a number. Or you can kind of feel liberated by that and say, okay, well then I'm just going to do my job and then that's it. But to but answer it your question though, on the supervisor part of it all, I would just really want to understand where is that career going? If you become a supervisor, is it worth it? What's next? And if it's not, if if there isn't a career path after your supervisor, then leave because you've already been there for six years and they clearly aren't recognizing you. I think though some of it is the title and the feeling you get from it. I strived. You and I were both managers in our job titles, right? But you you go for this whole, like, you're going after, I've got that manager title. But what does that entail? Who was going for that? It's it's part of, like, the North American culture. Like, you're... I, I want to be clear. I understand that, Todd. But I quite literally do not care. I My only priority is how much the check is. 100%. But what I'm saying is... But clearly not for you. No. You're, you haven't let me finish because you cut me off. So what I was saying is in North America, especially if you've gone through university and post-secondary education, there's this push. You need to make it to manager. What You got to be manager. What does manager mean? You and I were both managers. You made way more than I did and you were a manager, but you didn't have employees. I Yeah, who was I managing? Exactly. Whereas I made way less than you, and I was also a manager on my business card, but I had all the bullshit that goes with managing a staff of 56 employees. Yeah. You like, don't need what you, are you going what are you going after and what are you going after it for? You need to be a supervisor supervising things that are not people. Yeah. You don't want to be supervising people. It's a lot, a lot. I, although I, I do have to say this. I loved it. I made a point. So I had personnel files and stuff and I made a point of knowing at least one personal thing within my first month, of uh, going to a new facility. Cause that was something that was hard about my job is within 48 hours notice, I could be moved to a new site. And so I always wanted to know something. This is where I studied small group dynamics in university. Like I love people. This is why I guess I have a bigger social battery than you. And I get that charge when we have social interactions. I am on 1% just from this story. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it because I, I always tried to make it softer. So I was, I wasn't like senior management or anything. I was like the first level up into being quote manager. So I viewed my job as being the filter of the corporate BS that's coming down. And how can I make this a happy work environment? So that's why on my own personal dime, I did Valentine's Day 
little gift baggies for everyone every year and Easter gift baggies and Christmas gift baggies. And you, like, yeah, all, you, like you that. Were good. I liked it because I was going after manager because I wanted to be the fun, like not team leader because I also didn't like when someone called you a supervisor, but I wanted to like, I wanted that fun work environment. That's what I was trying to do was to create that. That's why I was going after manager. So okay, are, but like that, who? That's like being a teacher. Like, who's, but people love it. People who's that, paying for that? Me on my on my rich banker salary. I was paying for all of that. Well, I'm sorry for you to, for you to be a good supervisor. Rich going banker to, salary. There's some money missing. Apparently, you got a secret account somewhere. Todd, I made good money. Yeah. In comparison. But I loved it. I mean, we knew I know that. that when I, you studied leader, or what did you study? <clears throat> Entrepreneurship and innovation. And I studied recreation and leisure. We knew that you were going to make more money than me. Always knew it. Like, but sugar baby, but always do I, in the making. <laughs> but do I need to be paying for you to go to the dollar store in Walmart to buy chocolates and cellophane so you can make re- but that like, was coming out of my portion of the money going in and it added joy to my life and i liked it i i made the best of my time in that career what broke me was the homophobia within the organization yeah and the clear value difference between me and senior management that allowed that homophobia to continue that was what broke me. I did my best. Those dollar store and Walmart trips for those little gift baggies was me coping. And, and I want to be clear because we know how people can be in the comments, okay? <laughs> I'm glad that you did that. And me making that joke wasn't me like... I didn't you, take that. I know, but like, they need to realize... Sometimes, like, people, sometimes people are like... Okay, Tyler, you had a a high paying job and you're holding it against Todd. Like, you know how people can be. My God. We don't feel that way. At all. Like, I don't care because we had, from the day we got divorced, (laughs) engaged. It's like divorced and engaged, like combined. Okay, so from the day we got engaged, we had a joint bank account. So his money, he goes and does all that work and makes all that money, but half of it's mine, honey's. So... I'm not out here taking offense to his jokes. Well, I really hope that that was helpful. Probably not, but hopefully. We went, we did go on a tangent on, on that one. A couple, but I feel like it adds context to like, it's not an easy decision. Just make sure that if you want to go through and go after that promotion, it's something that you actually want and not something that you feel that you're supposed to attain. And if you don't really want it, make sure- Make sure that you're valued for it. Make sure you're getting paid for it because we've all been in jobs that we put our heads down, we're making good money, and then we just, you know, you don't really want to be doing it, but you get through it. So it has to be one or the other. Otherwise, what for? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, that's been another episode of Tangents (laughs) with Tyler and Todd. We'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. Bye.